right, what's going on, everybody? Good to see you today. How many of you glad you came to church today? Absolutely. Such an awesome start to the day. We're kicking off a brand new five-part series today called Build Life. I'll tell you all about that here in just a few minutes, but I want to take a look into the camera, say a big hello to everybody who's joining us online today. However, whenever and from wherever you're joining us, we're so glad that you're there, so glad that you're along for the ride, and whatever's got you out of the room today, we hope to see you in the room real soon. But until then, we want to let you know that we know you're there and we love you. Hey, so one more time, put your hands together, everybody, and say hello to everybody joining us online. Yeah, yeah, and a special welcome to those of you who are with us for the first time. Maybe you're celebrating uh, somebody's spiritual step in water baptism. Such an exciting time here as a church family. And just want to encourage everybody in the room today that we do water baptisms out in the parking lot because that's all that we have room to do. And when we dismiss from this from this room, the servant is, service isn't over. It's just moving out to the parking lot. So if you would, please just join us out there. We make a, a big deal about it. It's a fun time. So please just go out and help us celebrate these steps of water baptism. And then last week was Easter, and it was all about Jesus. And wasn't it amazing? We had a great Easter Sunday. And with all of that, didn't get an opportunity to celebrate this new kid space that we have, our Pines Kids Suite at the end of the deck up here. Such an incredible opportunity to love our church family so much better. And uh, we spent the past five weeks leading up to Easter getting that space ready. And, and uh, I mean, it was just such a blessing. If we had not had that space last week, we would have literally been run over, overflowing with kids. And it, they were busting out of the seams even with the new space. And I just want to thank you guys so much for your faithfulness and giving and your generosity because we didn't take out a loan for that. We didn't have to take a special offering for that. We paid for that with you guys' as regular tithes and offerings. And I want to thank you for that. And uh, just a couple of things as we get used to that space space. Um, when you go as a family, a couple of things. One, when you go over there, there's a double door closest to this suite. If you would enter through the double doors and then go through the hall and exit through the single door on the back side, it's just kind of a one-way hallway. Uh, it does a couple of things. One, it helps keep the traffic moving, uh, traffic flow moving well, but it also helps us make sure that that environment is a safe environment uh, because that other door on the end is locked. So it's designed for one way in and one way out. It's for your safety. Um, it's also to make sure that traffic flows well. And then as you go pick up your kids, I know we're excited to see it. And if you haven't seen the space, we would love for you to see it because it's beautiful. Uh, but going forward, if you would just send in one parent or family member to pick up your children with the sticker, um, that way it'll keep the hallways from getting too crowded. So just kind of one way in, one way out, and then one family member go to pick up the kids with your sticker, and that would really help the team. But it's such an exciting, wonderful space, and I know that your kids are loving kids' ministry even more than they already were. Well, I'm excited today to get into this Build Life campaign. This is a, this is a, a pivotal uh, did I say campaign? To get into this, this, this is what it is. I'm sorry. I got there too early. I'm so excited uh, to get into this pivotal series for our church because this is a pivotal and, and a significant step in our church. So before we get into that, let's just go to the Lord and, and let's pray this simple prayer that we pray every week. Come on, pray this after me. Say, dear Lord, those things I don't know, teach me. Those things I haven't seen, show me. And those things you have prepared for me, Prepare me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's, let's get into it. Uh, one of the foundational verses for our church, and really it's one of my life verses, comes from John 10.10. 10. It's in your message notes. If you've got message notes, you can follow along. If you want to look at it in your Bible, I don't need either because I got it in my heart. Jesus said that we have an enemy, a thief, the devil, and he's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy but I've come that they might have, that you might have life and life to the full. And our mission statement as a church, if you're new here, is centered around this verse. Our mission statement as a church says we exist to lead people in a relationship with Christ that's full and vibrant in every season, what we call an evergreen life. And Jesus is working and building his church, and he is, he is building Life. Jesus has done this in so many ways in so many people's lives. And, and really the, the, the first step to get on this journey, it is the most important step. Last week on Easter Sunday, I ended by asking you this question. 
And I want to make sure that you have the right answer. A lot of times I don't like to tell you there's a right answer and a wrong answer because we're all on a journey. But there's some of these things that you need to have the right answer when somebody asks you. And this is one. Jesus asked his closest, one of his closest disciples, Peter. He said, hey, Peter, I'm trying to do a little survey. Who do people say that I am? What are you hearing about me in the community? And Peter said, well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Some say you're a good teacher. He said, yeah, that's all awesome. But I just would love to have been there in the moment when Jesus squares Peter up face to face. And he says, yeah, but who do you say that I am? It's one thing for what the world says. It's one thing for what everybody else says. But it's important that each and every one of you can answer this question confidently and correctly. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because Peter's response to this question really is why we are standing here today. Jesus asked him, he said, what do you say, Peter? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, this is the right answer, just in case you were wondering. The right answer is, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. You're Jesus, Savior of the world, hope of the world. You are, uh, I love it, Manny. Uh, Emmanuel said that his name, he doesn't have the same name as God, but Emmanuel actually means God with us. So it's pretty close. It's a close second. Uh, but, but that's who he is. That he gave that answer. And look at Jesus' response. He said, blessed are you, Simon. He's talking, he's talking to Peter. He says, blessed are you, Simon, Peter, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. you no, nobody, everybody's saying all these things. No person revealed this to you. But this was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. So that's the right answer, that you're the Christ, you're Messiah, you're the hope of the world. And with this right answer, check out what Jesus says. And I tell you that you are Peter. So he changes his name from Simon to Peter. And he says, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Hey, everybody, Jesus is building his church. Amen. Jesus is building life. It started way back here with Peter. It started with Peter's response to this seminal question that each and every one of us have to answer. And if that's your step today, we've been praying for you that you would respond and make Jesus the Lord of your life, that he would be Christ, that he would be your Lord, that he would be your Savior, that you would enter into a personal relationship with him. That's the most important step that you could take. Last week on Easter Sunday, 43 people made that decision. Last week, 43 people gave their lives to Jesus. It's incredible. Today, we're baptizing at least 20 people who have made that decision in following Jesus. It's, it's awesome. But we're not through. Last week, we did a little survey. The majority of people responded, A, I already have a relationship with Jesus. 43 people responded, I am beginning a relationship with Jesus. Five people marked C, which means I am considering, I need time to consider a relationship with Jesus. And one person marked D, saying, I don't ever plan on accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So you know what that means? We still got work to do, right? Like that is why we're here. We exist for that, that heaven and hell are reality. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is building his church. He did it through Peter. Peter isn't the foundation of the church. It's the revelation that's the foundation of the church. The apostle Paul comes along and, and God began to build the church through the apostle Paul. And then men and women have come along over the past 2,000 years and been a part of building this church. And we stand here today. And no matter what you read in the news, no matter what you see on the headlines, can I tell you something? We're winning. We wouldn't be here today if we weren't. Yeah. Jesus is building his church. You know how he does it? He does it relationally. He does it one changed life after another. There's this uh, letter, this, uh, you would call it a book in the Bible in Ephesians. And this letter or this book in the Bible is written to a group of people. It says it's written to the Ephesians. Most theologians believe that it's not just a, a church in the city of Ephesus, but this would have been a circular letter that was written to be spread around to everybody who was living in that area, which was today, today it's mod, we know it as modern-day Turkey. So this was a letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote just to encourage the church. And look what he says in Ephesians 2.19. He says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, 
built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, come on, of Isaiah and Peter and Paul and John and Mary and Ringo. I'm just kidding. I've seen if you're paying attention. <laughs> Stay with me now. And he said, um, with, and Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too. Everybody say, me too. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. You know, there's many metaphors in the Bible for this thing we call the church. There's the metaphors of the body of Christ. The, we are the, the family of God. We are, you know, part of each other. But there's also this metaphor that Paul uses about a building, that we are being built together. Peter even uses this imagery in some of his books. He, he says that we are living stones or, or lively stones, that God has brought us together. I look around this room and I see people that are in this room that have, we've been doing life with for a long time, and some of you, you're here for the first time. But I love what he says in Ephesians 3. He says, God is taking you. You're no longer foreigners and you're no longer strangers to each other, but you're becoming citizens. You're becoming a family and God's bringing you together to build something special. He uses this analogy of building. I've got this brick here. I got my friend in the room a little while back, brought me his brick. And I had this brick and what I know about this brick, this brick can do some cool stuff. This brick would make a really good paperweight. It'll hold this paper down, right? That, that's something that it'll do. This brick would work really well to hold a door open, be a good doorstop. Um, this brick would be a really good something to take and... No, I'm kidding. It's not, it's not for that. You know, you can use this brick for a lot of different purposes. But what this brick was designed to do was to be laid on a foundation beside another brick on top of another brick, to be put together one after another on top of each other to build something really special, to, to build a shelter, to build a cover, to build a refuge, to build a home, to build a building, to build a lot of things. And Paul says, really, this is you and this is me. That in this metaphor of God building his church, we're bricks and we bring our lives and we use our lives and through the apostles, through the, through the prophets, through people like D.L. Moody, people like John Wesley, people like Billy Graham, that God has been building his church over the past 2,000 years that we're, so we're standing here today because of them. You know, this church today is six years, one month, and 27 days old. I Googled it. You can do that. And that's what God's been doing. God's been bringing people together, knitting people together, uniting people together. We've got people in this room today that were a part of this church before the church started. Like there's people in this room that brought their brick before there even was a building. Six years ago, six years, one month, and 27 days ago, we were in the Hollywood movie theater on the West Loop over there by Rudy's. It smelled like popcorn and dead mice. Yeah, you laughed because you weren't there. And we actually, matter of fact, we had some of those people who brought their brick, like some of them are still in the room. If you were on that launch team, would you stand up? Say, that was me. Where are you? Where are you at? Wayno. Yeah, the Wimmer's right here. Angela, Jennifer. Chris is in the back somewhere. I don't see you. And then Megan's up in the back. Matter of fact, Megan's up there doing the, the, the words on the screen today. Six years, one month, and 27 days ago, she was doing the exact same thing. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's just people. People who have brought their brick. Some of you were there. Some of you laughed because you were in the movie theater and you knew what it smelled like. If you were in the movie theater, would you stand up? Say, I, we were there way back when. Yeah, that's awesome. Look at that. Look at you. Come on, can we thank these guys? With smelly, stinky. But they showed up. So we could see something. Now, come on, everybody else stand up. Let's all stand up together. Ephesians 3.20, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but Ephesians 3.20 says that, that it's God who is at work within you. Go ahead and put it up there, Megan. God who is working within you to do exceedingly abundantly more. Now, all glory to God. 
He's able. Hey, can, all glory to God, he's done this. Yeah. All glory to God, he's brought us to this moment. 1,111 people over the past six years, one month, and 27 days have given their life to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might even think. God's at work, guys. God was at work in a handful of people six years ago who never even heard me preach. God was at work through people who stood up who were in the movie theater who are still a part of it today. And today, we're no longer foreigners and strangers. But we're the body of Christ. We're the family of God. We are people who God is using to build something. Not a building, but to build life for East Texas for generations to come. But you have your seat. You know, we're on a spiritual journey. If you're new to the church today, I'm, I'm just, I know something about you without even knowing you, that you're on a spiritual journey. Whether you know it or not, you're on a spiritual journey. We all had to go on. I talked about Peter and his response to Jesus in that moment when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? By that time, Peter had come through several things on his spiritual journey that had led him to that moment where he could make that bold declaration, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you are him. He went on this journey that Angela and I went on when we pulled up roots of 15 years of life in ministry in Mississippi to begin the journey to plant the church. It's the journey that our friends who showed up before we even had a church. It's the, the story and the journey of the people who were in a smelly, stinky movie theater, but, but God began to do something in their life that God has been building lives. Jesus, says, Jesus said that I have come that you might have life and life to the full. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is building lives. And we all have to go on this same spiritual journey. G Peter went on it as well. Luke chapter 5, if you want to turn and look at this with me. Otherwise, they're going to put it in the, on the screen. It's in the notes. Luke chapter 5. This is a story of Peter. It says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people who were crowding around him and listening to the word of God, and he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out, and this is Simon Peter now, and he put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. So this is, this is Jesus' is calling Peter into ministry. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they, carried, they, they carried, came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the fish, at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore, and they left everything, and they followed him. And God did amazing things. Acts 2 tells us that Peter preached the first gospel message that 3,000 people responded to, and then 5,000 people responded to, that we stand here today because of moments like this, Peter went on the journey. We're all on the journey. But there's kind of three levels to this journey. And as we enter into this season of our church, I want to share these with you and ask you to consider these. When it comes to the spiritual journey that you're on, it starts with the question, what can I afford? What can I afford? And I love Peter's response because Peter, Peter had a sense of reverence to him. He knew that there was something special about this man, Jesus. And he was, I love his response, Master, hey, you're significant. There's something to this guy. Master, we've toiled all night, and we haven't caught anything. There's some reverence in his attitude, but yet he's been fishing all night, and, he, and the Bible says that he's cleaning his nets. 
So if he's going to throw his nets out again and him thinking I'm not even going to catch anything when I do it, that means he's also got to go through cleaning the nets. Like Amato, my friend, is here on the second row. He's a painter, right? If you painted one time, you clean your brush. Do you want to clean the brush again? No, it's the same thing if you've ever cleaned a paintbrush. Like, I don't want to go back and do that again because this is his business and his livelihood, and it's actually going to cost him time. And as a business owner, his time is his money. So he's thinking about this as a business proposition. Okay, okay, I'm going to do it. I haven't caught anything, and if I throw them out again, I'm going to have to clean them again. That's going to cost me time. I, I can't afford that, Lord. That's the, the, the beginning for all of us. You come to this place, and, and you, maybe you've given Jesus the, the keys to the heart, your heart, that you've given, made him the Lord of your life, but yet you're still kind of on this fence of, well, but I don't know what else there is. You know, I don't, I don't, it, is this going to cost me something? I don't, I don't know if I'm ready to give anything to the cause of Christ. And that leads to the second thing. Peter, once he comes to his senses, he says, okay, okay. Because you said so, I'll do it again. That obedience and sacrifice are closely associated. Second question on this spiritual journey is, what can I sacrifice? That once Jesus has made a difference in my life and I, and I get around a room full of such incredible, spirit-filled, on-fire people who love God, if something begins to stir on the inside of me, okay, okay, wait a minute, something's going on here. I need to contribute, but what can I let go of? Now, that's the challenge that we all face. When, when Angela and I first committed our life to Christ, we were coming straight out of the world. So we were having to sacrifice maybe some relationships, some, some hobbies, some attitudes, some habits. Like I begin to go on this journey, okay, what can I let go? Peter says, okay, but at your word, because you say so, I'm going to throw the nets in. I'm going to do it again. Knowing this time he's doing it and it's going to cost him something. Your spiritual journey at some point, if it hasn't cost you nothing, then you're kind of at a, kind of at a standstill. Because for Jesus it cost him everything. And when Jesus says, come and follow me, it comes at a cost. It comes at a sacrifice. But that's not the point. The point really isn't the what can I afford. The point isn't what can I sacrifice or just obedience for obedience sake. You want to know what the point of Christianity is? It's asking this third question. God, what do you want to do through me? That really is the pinnacle of this Christian journey. And it's not just the pinnacle of this Christian journey, but sociologists will tell you. People, people they'll tell you. That the pinnacle, from a psych psychological point of view, the pinnacle of human existence is, is what they call transcendence. It's when I lay my head down on my pillow at night, I feel like my life mattered. And that was Jesus' final response. Okay, okay, you took that step. You, you counted the cost. You made the sacrifice. Check out his response. Okay, you did it, but don't be afraid. Because from now on, you're not going to fish for fish anymore. You're going to be a fisher of men. You're going to fish for people. You've, you've, made, you've counted the cost. You've made some sacrifice, but that's not what I really wanted. I wanted to do something through you. And that's the greatest message that anybody can hear. And that's what I want to hear you today. You to hear today that God has called you because he wants to do something through you. That we stand here today on, on Peter's sacrifice and on the Apostle Paul, on, on all of these great men and women of the faith over the last 2,000 years of a handful of people who got in on a launch team, on a, on a bigger group of people who were in a theater, and now here we are together. God is building his church. I mean, look around you for a second. Are you comfortable in here? Is anybody hot? Some people are fanning, some people are cold, some people are like fanning. I mean, it's just, we're crammed in here. It's a slow journey out of this room, out into the, I mean, it's just, God's building his church. And again, Ephesians 3.20, now to God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that he, we can ask, think, or hope, right, th through what he's doing in us, right, he's doing it. He's doing it. 
And if five people on a launch team or 30 people from a movie theater, if God did exceedingly abundantly above, and I'll tell you what, I'm living the dream. Like to be six years into this church and to see all of you, to see 40 people respond to Jesus on a, ba- on a Easter, to see 20 people getting baptized the week after Easter, man, it's a pastor's dream. I love it. He is doing exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask, think, or hope for. And if he's done all that to this point, what would, he, what would it look like if we all did something together? Like for what's next? And that's why today we're kind of introducing this Build Life Stewardship Initiative that, that we've established that we can't stay here, that God continues to add people, that the church continues to grow. And we need to build a building because God is building lives. Let's check out this video real quick. I'm Diane Heindel. I am an attorney here in Tyler. And this is my husband, Robin. And we started uh, coming to Pines on the very first day. I remember Les came up and introduced himself and made us feel welcome. And so it was a good experience. We just kept coming back. It has been so exciting ever since. We have become a part of the legacy team. We're on the board. We know our pastor very well now. And, um, And that's important to us. We're on the dream team. And that's a great thing for us in that we're both breeders. And we have been for... Uh, I'll, it's been five years now that we've been going to this church and, and greeting all the wonderful people who come through the doors. I like seeing the people come in every morning and saying hi to them and getting to know them. And every Sunday, it seems like there's new people coming to church that we see. Uh, so we were growing and uh, we're really excited that we can be a part of building God's church. I think that we've got a great location and Bullard. Uh, it's right in the path of growth. Um, I think and it's going to be a high impact location for the church. Um, when we get it built, it's going to be very good visibility. So I think it will help us grow. Uh, kind of like you build it, they'll come. <laughs> so it's, uh, that's, I think that's what's going to happen. It's very important to me to be a part of this because when we're gone, anything we've contributed to building this church uh, will still be going on and people are going to be saved after we're gone. Over the past five years, God has really become more real in my life and I have uh, always come to churches looking what they could do for me. How are you going to minister to me? And somehow along the way when we start building this church, it came to me that what can I do for my church and how can I help? And that's changed everything for me. And that's changed everything, she said. I love it. I didn't show you the video to show you the land because I've got a picture of the building right here. What I love about her testimony is that she came to a place where God did something through her. The greatest question that we can ask God on our spiritual journey and in a season like this is, God, what do you want to do through me? We're taking this step. God, what do you want to do through us? Matter of fact, why don't we take you through the building, and then I will share with you kind of some things that I want you to know about this. This is about a 17,000 square foot phase one of what will be a multi-phase project on the 17 and a half acres that we have. We have 17 and a half acres. You you can actually go down there, and we've cleared off about four of those acres because we're going to have our first Wednesday service, Lord willing, on that property. We're going to have a kind of an old-fashioned tent revival down there, y'all, before there's even a building. So be on the lookout for that. In a couple of weeks, there's going to be a sign on the property that says, 
future home of Church of the Pines. Like Things are advancing, and you guys have been giving, because we've been talking about this for a little while. So as we get into this Build Life Stewardship Initiative, let me, let me tell you what I'm asking for you as your pastor. I'm asking you to go with me on this spiritual journey for the next five weeks. Okay, and go through the journey. Angela and I have been going on this journey ourselves. It starts with, okay, here it is. Let me tell you, our, kind of what we believe God is leading us to. What, we, what is the, what we need to take this next step is $2.5 million over three years. That's what stu- get the Build Life Stewardship Initiative is. $2.5 million over three years. And what I'm asking you to do is to take the next five weeks. I want you to pray and ask God and go on this journey. Again, Angela and I have been going on this journey because we've known this moment's coming. It starts with, Lord, what can I afford? How, how can I contribute to this? And then it goes from there to, okay, okay, what can, what can I sacrifice? Maybe a little Starbucks here or a little out to eat here, a, a shirt here or there. But I'm not asking you to do either one of those things. Go on the journey. But really what I'm asking you is to come to a place where we all ask God together, God, what do you want to do through me? What do you want to do? Because he's an exceedingly abundantly above everything that we can ask, think, or hope kind of God. And I believe that if we will all do this over the next five weeks, all ask God, God, what do you want to do through me? That when we respond to that together, that we will celebrate something that only God can do. God's going to do it. This is happening. God's doing it. How do you want to position yourself for him to work through? And some of you hear this and you're like excited. I want to write a check. I want to give it to you right now. I want to start giving right now. But I'm, please don't. Go on the journey. Maybe it's something different than what you're thinking right now. I'm not asking you to decide today. I'm asking you to to spend some time, whether you're single or together with your family or maybe even with a group of friends. Go on this journey and seek God. And then in five weeks, we're going to come together on May the 5th and we're all going to come together and we're going to express what the Lord has put on our hearts to do through us as we take this huge step for our local church. And then on May 12th, We're going to come together on that next Sunday. And what I'm asking you to do is as you prayed about what God wants to do through you, that on Sunday, May 12th, we're going to come together and bring what, what it's a real churchy sound and Bible sound and thing, but we're going to, we're going to have a first fruits offering. The first fruits is meaning that we're just going to come together on May 12th and whatever the Lord has put on our heart that he wants to do through us over three years, we're going to come together on the 12th and we're going to give the very best of that portion that we can. And those are the things that are going to allow us to continue moving this thing forward. There's steps ahead for us. The the only next step is to go ahead and and get plans like construction drawings in the works. Like that's the next step. So this, this initiative will help us take that step, will prepare us for the down payment for the building to get us uh, kind of over the hump, if you will. So that's what this is going to do. And again, all I'm asking you to do is pray and ask God, God, what would you do like to do through me? Because as beautiful as this is, look around for a second. Like this is great. People have come to know Jesus in these chairs, in this room, in these seats. Every one of these chairs, everyone in this room, kids ministry, every one of those is a life that God wants to touch and a life that Jesus came and died to build. We're going to build life. Make no mistake about it. This this is not about building a building. This is just the next step in building lives. In building lives. So as you leave today, every everyone will have the opportunity to get this build life brochure. I'm asking you to take one per household. Um, if you need to take one to somebody, feel free. We'll print more. But every one of you, one per household, will receive this. would love for you to get that, take that. It has all the information that you need. And then also out there, we put, we put our black bracelets on the back burner, and we got these green bracelets out there that say Project 633. And again, this isn't a, a building thing. This is a spiritual thing. And if it's spiritual, it means it involves prayer. And we're asking you guys to pray, not just about what God wants to do through you, 
but pray for the church. Pray for every part of this thing. And so this says Project 633 in English and in Spanish. And we're just asking you to, at 633 in the morning, and for those of you who are up, and 633 in the evening, that every time you see 633, if you would just take a minute and pray for what God wants to do through this initiative. And then we're going to be sending out through email some uh, prompts and some prayer devotionals that you can pray through and you can lead your family through. And I'm just asking you as your pastor, please don't unsubscribe from emails during this during this stewardship initiative. We're trying to lead you spiritually. It's not junk mail. Come on, Jesus ain't junk. I'm sorry, that's, that's dirty. That's, that's a low blow. I'm sorry. Stay and we're going, we're, going, we're going on a spiritual journey. Everybody say it's spiritual. We're going on a spiritual journey, believing that God will do exceedingly abundantly above everything that we could ask, think, or hope through the power of Christ who works within us. Amen? Bow your head and close your eyes. So let's put all that talk to the side for a minute because I'm going to start where I finished. But the most important decision you can make, the most important thing, God really can't do anything through you until you give him room in your life. Again, Peter's response to Jesus asking, who do you say that I am? It's important that you have the right answer to that question today. And maybe you don't. Maybe you find yourself in this room today far from God, out of relationship. Maybe it was like Emmanuel talked about at the beginning of the service. You're standing at the bottom of a mountain looking at, up at something that you can't climb, and it's because you're trying to do it alone. Jesus is the answer. There's an enemy. He's killing, stealing, and destroying. He's trying to keep you down. But Jesus came that you might have life and life to the full. Jesus came and lived a, lived a sinless, flawless life, offered himself up as a living sacrifice to die on the cross for your sins. The Bible tells us that, that blood of Jesus, it covered and washed our sins clean so that we could have right relationship with God. So that we could, And then God raised Jesus from the dead after three days so that we could have relationship with God and walk in victory in this life and experience the ultimate victory, which, would, which is eternal life. Jesus wants to work and build your life. And today, maybe he brought you here to experience that That is your next step on the spiritual journey. So I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. And if today you need Jesus, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Or maybe maybe you need to put him back on the throne and put him in first place. Would you all pray this prayer with me out loud? Pray this after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. Today I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins because you love me so much. And today I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead with the same spirit and power with which I can now live. And today, today I surrender. Today I say, Jesus is Lord. Lead me and guide me. Build my life never to be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So come on, let's give God praise.